Okay, I think we can uh, make a start now. Let me first of all apologize for missing the lecture on Saturday. I'm afraid uh, circumstances beyond my control, okay? I'm not going to rush because we missed that lecture. There's plenty of time uh, I've allowed for questions and so forth, so we'll be able to go at the same pace and complete the course, okay? Today's lecture is about uh, the final stages of solidification. And I'm going to talk briefly about the transfer of heat, because after all, solidification is controlled by the transfer of heat. Uh, and then I'll go on to review a variety of casting technologies and give you some actual examples of components produced by casting. Well, one of the things that happens when most uh, materials solidify is that you get contraction. So there is a strong likelihood that the solid that forms pulls away from the surface of the mold. So you develop some sort of a gap between the mold and the thing that is solidifying. So heat transfer in some circumstances is simply by radiation across the gap. And the heat transfer rate is proportional then to the temperature difference between these two surfaces over here. So in, in circumstances where this gap is very large, in other words, the heat transfer coefficient, which I'll explain in the next slide, is small, you will get a fairly uniform temperature in the liquid. And the flow of heat is essentially controlled by transfer of heat across the gap. Uh, there will be circumstances where conduction of heat through the liquid also matters. So this is a, an intermediate case where we have conduction of heat in the liquid and also the transfer of heat across the gap. Now, this stands for a BO number, which is as follows. So it's the heat transfer coefficient, where the heat transfer coefficient is simply the proportionality between the heat flow rate and this temperature difference here. Okay, so that's the heat transfer coefficient. This is the thermal conductivity, and this is the dimension of the casting. So that tells you how much volume of material you have to cast. Now, obviously, if if this heat transfer coefficient is very large, then heat transfer across the gap is not going to be the rate controlling process. Okay? If it's very easy to transfer heat across the gap, then it's the conduction of heat in the liquid which will matter. So this is the scenario when this BO number is large. That means the flow of heat is controlled by conduction of heat through the liquid. On the other hand, if the thermal conductivity is very large, then you'll get a uniform temperature gradient in the liquid and heat flow is controlled by the transfer across the gap. So that's the case for the small BO number. Normally when we put liquid into a mold, the temperature of the liquid is higher than the melting temperature, significantly higher than the melting temperature. So the first stage of solidification consists of basically the liquid reaching its melting temperature. Okay? So solidification can't start until the melting temperature is reached. So during that stage, basically, um, in, in a case where the gap is controlling the transfer of heat, the flow of heat is equal to the heat transfer coefficient times that temperature difference. And all we are doing is we are taking heat from this liquid so if we take the cooling rate, multiply by the heat capacity per unit volume, and L essentially is the volume of the material if we take a unit cross-sectional area through the plane of the board. Okay? So the heat flow rate is simply given by the cooling rate times the heat capacity per unit volume times the volume of material that we have. Okay? So until, until the material reaches its melting temperature, the cooling rate of the liquid is simply uh, given by a rearrangement of this equation. We have the heat transfer coefficient, the temperature gap at this point, the volume of the material, and the heat capacity of the material. So everyone happy with that? Straightforward calculation of the heat flow rate given by the heat capacity of the liquid times the cooling rate times its volume. Now, 
what do you think will happen once the material reaches the melting temperature? Obviously, the melting temperature will be maintained constant until solidification is complete. But is there any other heat being generated during solidification? Is there any other heat source that we have to take account of? The latent heat of fusion. So although solidification happens at a constant temperature at the interface, so this is now the solid actually growing because we are at the melting temperature of the liquid, uh, the heat flow then is simply given by the speed of the solid liquid interface times the enthalpy of fusion, the latent heat of fusion. So the solidification rate will be a function of the latent heat of fusion. If the latent heat of fusion is very large, then the solidification rate will be very small. And of course, the heat transfer coefficient and the gap over here. So this is the case where the liquid has reached its melting temperature and the heat that is being extracted is the heat generated at the solid liquid interface, the latent heat of fusion. So those are the two stages in the solidification of a liquid. We now consider all the solidification theory that we've done and see how that applies to a variety of casting processes. And casting processes can be divided into two categories. One is where you have some sort of a permanent mold. You inject or you pour your molten liquid into the mold and then you reuse the mold. And I'll go through all of these uh, gravity die casting, pressure die casting, centrifugal casting, and continuous casting. And the scale here ranges from tiny components to, you know, the sort of things that go into your mobile phone, the magnesium, cast magnesium alloys, to continuous casting in which we produce about 1.3 billion tons of steel every year. And then we have these temporary molds where you might be making a small number of components, for example, very large propellers for ships. Okay. So sand castings, plaster castings, and very, very precise castings. The sort of things that you use for making jewelry or very complicated shapes to put into aircraft engines. So I'll give you examples of all of this. So the first case is, is die casting. And this, this is a die casting, and you can see that it's a very complex object. And what you have is basically a die of the right sort of shape, and you either pour metal into it, or you let the metal flow in under pressure, and then you basically produce your shape. So there's an awful lot of components uh, which are die cast. If ever you break one of your telephones, you'll see lots of magnesium die castings in there because magnesium is very light and basically a mobile phone doesn't have to have a, a huge amount of strength. Magnesium is not particularly uh, a good material for making large-scale structural components. Uh, all, there are many, many toys, metallic toys, which are made by die casting as well. So you can make extremely precise components. The die itself is usually water-cooled, okay? because uh, you know, if its temperature keeps on rising every time you make a new component, then it's, first of all, it's not going to give you reproducible properties, and secondly, the dye itself will wear out. So that brings us to another point, that the material that we are casting should have a low melting point relative to the material out of which the dye is made. And the dye is usually made from steel, which has a melting temperature in excess of 1500 degrees centigrade. And because many die castings are not really structural components, that means they don't have to support very large stresses, you can use uh, alloys which basically have a very low melting temperature. So a large number of die casting alloys are aluminum zinc alloys of eutectic composition. Okay. Now, any ideas why we choose a eutectic composition? So this is, this is a case we have, we have zinc and about five weight percent of aluminium. Why would we choose a eutectic composition? Yes. 
Okay, remember that we are not particularly interested in the strength and the toughness of the component. We basically want a shape of some sort with a reasonable amount of strength. The, the, that's one, one point that, you know, here you, you don't go through a stage a large temperature range where you have sol mixtures of solid and liquid. Any other reasons? Exactly. Yeah, so if we can get the melting temperature as low as possible, then we save on the wear and tear of the dye, we save on energy, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that's why most die casting alloys will be somewhere near a eutectic composition to get a minimum in the melting temperature. Sand casting is usually uh, uh, used for making large components. So for example, almost all car engines, you know, the engine blocks, are made out of aluminum silicon alloys which are cast uh, in sand castings. So, the basic technique is very simple, that you have a pattern of some sort, and you pack sand around it, then you remove the pattern, and then you pour the metal in. Now, that is an, uh, a grossly oversimplified description of sand casting, because, first of all, the component is likely to have very complicated shapes. You know, if you think about an engine block, there's all kinds of structure in that engine block, and it's good to get virtually the final shape from the casting process. Then you have to do very little machining afterwards. So the actual shape of the sand might be extremely complicated, and you also have to think about the rigidity of the sand itself. The sand may not be just a single uh, kind of sand. You might want much finer sand near the surfaces where the metal is going to be in contact so that you get good surface finish. And these things, which are called risers and feeders, they have to be arranged in such a way that there are no regions within your casting which will be left with holes because there isn't enough feeding of metal. So all of this can be calculated using uh, computational fluid dynamics and solidification theory and so forth to design the mold very carefully so that you produce extremely complicated shapes with no porosity or very little porosity, and you don't scrap, uh, you scrap as little material as possible by machining. Okay. So let me just show you one component which is made by sand casting. So this is a, a propeller for a large ship. It's made out of uh, an aluminum tin alloy, which is known as aluminum bronze. And this is actually made by Rolls-Royce uh, Marine. You notice that the blades themselves are moving blades. It's not a single casting. And the reason is, nowadays you don't need a rudder. You know, you can just change the configuration of the propeller and steer the ship. Okay. So obviously you don't make huge numbers. You, you don't make you know, millions of, compo uh, of propellers. So sand casting is a very good technique for something like this. And in any case, the surface has to be machined into the right hydrodynamic shape afterwards. So the surface finish doesn't matter very much. Sand castings have a relatively poor surface finish compared with die castings. Now this is a, a really spectacular technique where you make tubes, large tubes, by a process known as centrifugal casting. So you have a, a cylindrical mold which is rotating, and then liquid metal is poured into it. And you see you know, enormous fireworks type <coughs> operations happening in, in a real factory. And the point is that you produce tubes. You don't have to drill those tubes, etc. You can make them on a very large scale, and you waste very little material in producing the final shape. Uh, also, because the mold is uh, turning around at a high speed, you get a good homogeneity inside your centrifugal casting. So chemical segregation effects are minimized. And a large number of the sort of 
uh, pipes and tubes that are used in chemical plant for aggressive processing are made using centrifugal casting. In, in our laboratory, we have a very small scale centrifugal casting system because when we make a, a particular sample for experimentation, we want it to be chemically homogeneous. So any calibration standards for microanalysis experiments are made using centrifugal casting. This is a, a, a process which originates from the castings of, of jewelry. Jewelry has a very, very intricate shape, and the, exactly the same process is used for making very complex turbine blades. So this is a turbine blade for an aircraft engine. And this is amazing technology because the blade actually operates in an environment which is higher than its melting temperature. So it has to be made in a form which is very precise and uh, which allows cooling channels. Okay? Because obviously if it's operating in an environment which is hotter than its melting temperature, then you've got to cool, uh, keep it keep the actual metal temperature below, below that. And it's also made as a single crystal. And I'll explain to you how, how this happens to be a single crystal and why we need it to be a single crystal. The basic method is that you make a model of the blade from wax. So this is a wax model. And here you can see a blade. And you see this pyrolo here, which is there. And the actual wax model is made using lasers. Okay, so you have a sort of a, a liquid. A laser plays on the liquid and builds up the pattern, which you then use to make the turbine blades out of wax. You then pour a particular ceramic around this okay, and burn off the wax. You burn or melt it off. So you're left with a rigid ceramic mold, which can survive very high temperatures, in other words, carry liquid metal, and has the intricate shape of the original wax model, including, you know, for example, the cooling channels and so forth. Okay? And then you pour metal through the center of this ceramic mold, and it flows into these regions, which are now hollow in here, and it fills them up. You then withdraw this mold through a temperature gradient so that solidification proceeds from the bottom right to the top. Okay. So imagine that solidification starts over here. Then you'll have lots and lots of grains forming, right? You know, because this is now the surface where grains nucleate. However, only one grain will actually make it through this spiral. Okay, because the others will be stopped by that spiral. So the grain, which is growing fastest along the spiral, will make it to this point, and the rest of this solidifies as a single crystal. So this, this is a commercial process. You, know, you make turbine blades by the hundreds using a process like this. Any ideas why this ought to be a single crystal? So go back to the lectures I gave you on diffusion. Supposing that it's not a single crystal. Yeah, remember, this blade will be going round at about 30,000 RPM in the engine at temperatures which are very, very high. So there will be lots of stresses acting on it. But grain boundaries are easy diffusion parts. Do you remember we did a little calculation which showed that diffusion happens much more rapidly along a grain boundary? You've got a component which is under stress at high temperatures. It will tend to extend by diffusion. Okay? So if we eliminate grain boundaries, then the turbine blade retains its shape for a much longer time because diffusion has to happen through the perfect regions of the blade rather than along the grain boundaries. So single crystal blades have a greater creep strength than polycrystalline blades. So almost all the critical blades in modern aero engines are single crystal blades. 
Now, there is a, a problem with this in, in that this is extremely uh, uh, laborious work to assemble the individual blades on here and put the different ceramic components in there to leave cooling channels and so forth. So you, you need a large production line to do this delicate work of assembling all the wax bits and pieces and the ceramic things which leave the cooling channels. In the future, it is likely that this will be replaced by the following. Okay. Now, this obviously is a, is, is a chess piece, okay? but look how complicated it is. Inside here, you can see a spiral, okay? and you can see a staircase going in there. And if I, if I just play this uh, little movie, Yeah, you can see the spiral staircase, and there was a, a, a little spiral inside there, and so on. Now, the way that this is made is not by, not by casting, but you build up a layer-by-layer -layer object, okay? Using, using technology, which is still in its infancy, you actually build it up layer-by-layer -layer in three dimensions. So you first create this component on a computer, and then you send that uh, CAD or computer-aided design data to your machine, which creates the object layer by layer. Now, if you do that, you go directly to your final component from the liquid. You don't have to have the wax models and so forth and so on. So th this is something which will come in the near future. We can already do the same thing uh, by depositing layers of metal using welding. But in this case, it's done using lasers. <coughs> now, you remember this slide which I showed you of metal poured into a mold, and we, we have these fine crystals here. They're coarsen because some of the crystals are stifled off uh, by those which are growing more rapidly, and you end up with this pipe because the liquid has contracted and there's nothing to feed liquid into that uh, void that is left by the contraction. Well, this is extremely wasteful. Okay? Uh, you know, imagine having to throw away that much of your material. Extremely wasteful. So, frankly speaking, this is hardly ever used except for making very special small quantities of materials. You do not actually use what's known as ingot casting. That means you cast metal into a mold and let it solidify. Instead, you have this fantastic process known as continuous casting, which completely removes this problem and many other problems. So continuous casting is as follows. You have here a ladle which, which contains uh, your molten material that, that supply supplies this tun dish, which is another container, continuously with metal. So as soon as this one runs out, another one comes in place and keeps this continuously supplied 24 hours a day. Liquid metal then goes through this mold, which is a copper mold, cooled with water. And basically, you solidify your material in there. And even if it's partially solidified, if you have a shell of solid around here, then it can exit this mold and continue down here. You can see the, the curvature here because it's very, very hot. And you simply chop off relevant sections of maybe 30 tons or so. This is a real continuous casting operation. You can see the bending of the hot metal. And just to illustrate, the ladle here containing the molten metal. Okay. This region here is uh, the supply of metal to this container here. And then we have the uh, mold. And the mold itself is, is vibrating. And you may also put uh, electromagnetic stirring there to keep the material homogeneous and so on. So th this is the operation which produces the vast majority of materials produced by casting. There is absolutely no pipe there, for example. You can put electromagnetic stirring to get homogeneity or to get a fine grain size and many, many things. So almost all steel, almost all aluminum, are, you know, which are large scale production 
produced on a large scale are produced using continuous casting. Okay? So this is the process which governs most casting operations. And you can cast into many different shapes. You can have rectangular shapes, circular shapes, etc., and then process them further to get your final shape. And the processing, uh, sorry, uh, this is just showing uh, the further stages of this process. You can see the final bits coming out along here. So here you're casting many different strands. So after that, of course, you have to process it because, you know, supposing you want to make a car, then you need the metal in the form of a sheet. So you've got to deform it. Um, and you deform it on, for example, rolling mills and so forth. So my question is, what, does, what is the aim of this deformation apart from producing the right shape? Why are we going through uh, deformation? Because, you know, I could actually cast thin strip. Okay? There are processes which allow you to immediately cast thin strip continuously. Why would I want to actually put deformation to get my thin strip or, or whatever shape I want? What does deformation do? Yeah. So we get uh, work hardening. What else? Uh, and the work hardening happens because what is the cause of work hardening? Exactly. So you introduce many dislocations. Uh, what other changes you might expect? You know, what is the shape of a grain in three dimensions, roughly? Yeah, so you, you will flatten all the, all the grains. Okay? So supposing that you have a grain which is like this, then it will become extremely elongated. Okay? Now, the process that I'm showing you here is at a very high temperature. And it, in this particular case, it's steel. And the phase at high temperatures is uh, cubic F. Okay, it's iron in its cubic F form. In other words, uh, phase-centered cubic. And it's phase called austenite. When that cools, that will transform into body-centered cubic iron. So the finer the grain structure at this point, the finer will be the grain structure that we get after it has transformed. So all this processing is extremely helpful in breaking up all the solidification structure and giving us much, much finer grain structures. 